So, uh, Demian, you will uh, start the first part. Now everybody can you're, hear you're me too. Me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, hi. Um, I'll, I'll do the first part. Uh, try to give you a brief uh, introduction into uh, what SIO is and uh, specifically SIO Cup. And I know. Uh, at least I know some of the participants here, and I know some of you already know a bit of this, but I'll try to uh, also introduce some aspects of the system that maybe uh, you guys will be new to you. Um, so I'll start with um, uh, basically the, um, the SIO system. Um, so this uh, diagram here on this slide shows basically the, the core system that we have on SIO. It includes three main parts. Uh, the first part is the hardware part, and you can see it here on the left-hand side. There's either uh, the SIO Cup, which is the, um, the device we're currently discussing. There's also the SIO Mini, for those of you who, are, uh, who had a chance to see it or experience it. Uh, that, that was the first product we had in the market. We still have it on the market for certain applications, but then SIO Cup is a newer one that took over in some of the applications that we have. The second part is uh, a mobile phone application. That application uh, is the user interface for, for the users. So that's how you operate everything and get all the information. Uh, it will communicate via Bluetooth with the device and then operate the device. And then it also being used as a relay basically to the data coming from the device. And then it's been sent over to the third part of the system, which is the cloud system that we have. Um, the cloud system essentially um, uh, receives the raw data coming from the device via the phone. And then it goes through a set of models that we have developed. It's based on machine learning algorithms and a lot of data that we accumulate all the time uh, when we work you know, with laboratories and other uh, partners. And then we build models uh, based on that that will receive the spectrum coming from the device and turn it into an insight. Uh, a result, an analysis result that will be then sent back to the mobile phone and the user can actually see that. The overall process, you know, in real time takes about seven to eight seconds from the time you uh, press the button to scan until uh, you receive the results. Um, I'm assuming most of you know that uh, we're talking about a near infrared spectroscopy based uh, material analysis uh, system, but just for the sake of those who are not familiar with this. So the device itself is based on a core technology that we have developed, where we have a microspectrometer that we uh, developed uh, that is used to sense you know, the materials with near infrared light. And then based on that uh, spectral signature, basically we can uh, you know, analyze the, the, um, the material itself or the uh, making of the material. Um, lastly, uh, you know, since everything is cloud-based, then uh, we can always uh, make the data available for our users uh, via different channels. Uh, so, so data becomes uh, readily available, whether it is for historical data or for real-time data. I think we can move forward to the next slide. So, uh, SIO, um, we developed the technology for many years, and we've started to go to market uh, in agriculture and food just about uh, six or five or six years ago uh, when we first launched our first uh, units or first products. Today, we're uh, widely deployed within the world of agriculture with different uh, segments or verticals that we serve. Uh, and you can see here some examples. So today, SIOCOP is being used uh, for uh, analyzing uh, animal feed, like forage and other materials. It's been used to analyze all kinds of grains, like um, soybeans and wheat and corn and barley and others. Uh, it's been used to analyze all types of fruits. So berries, for example, like strawberries or blueberries. Um, this is actually a relatively new calibration that we have launched about a year ago. Um, and um, one other example uh, that's not with the SIO cup, it's actually with the SIO mini, is testing uh, corn moisture pre-harvest. So the cup is mostly used post-harvest. -har now the mini can be used pre-harvest to determine the corn moisture on the cob and take decisions like uh, harvesting time and, 
and other decisions that may be important for people who grow corn and seed corn. Uh, all in all, I think that uh, we, today we have a, quite a broad uh, deployment of our units uh, globally, all over the world, uh, with many, many users, thousands of users uh, using that, again, for the different types of applications. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, by the way, we see the questions that you guys have. We'll have a Q&A session by the end of the um, presentation, so happy to answer all of the questions there. Um, and please keep, keep sending them. Um, so, SioCop is, as I said, uh, the second device that we have released. Uh, the first SioCop released was actually in August of 2020, so about 18 months ago, a little bit more than that. Um, and SioCop is a result of us learning uh, about the needs of the agriculture seg uh, sector and basically building a device that will serve specifically that sector that will answer, uh, please go back, that will answer uh, the specific needs of agriculture. So uh, what, are they, what are these basic needs that are being answered by the SioCop? So first of all, uh, usually in agriculture, we're, we're talking about large samples that are quite non-homogeneous uh, and are difficult to sample. And when we have, you know, usually when we have the, the smaller uh, SIO mini device, we have to take many scans to take into account that variability within the sample. Uh, SIO cup allows you to, or the user, to basically put a relatively large sample into the cup and scan all of the sample at once. It helps uh, the user experience significantly, makes it much easier. And it also obviously improves the accuracy and performance overall. Um, SioCop, just like the Sio Mini, is very robust. It has no moving parts. It's easy to use. It's very much suitable to use on a farm, in the field, in various different locations where you want the unit to be simply robust. So it's totally built to support this type of environment. Um, last but not least, um, it's consistent, it's reputable, it's accurate. Uh, it was designed to be such. Uh, it is, um, in many cases, at par with benchtop near infrared devices that cost tens of thousands of dollars and are found in laboratories. We're able to um, reprodu reproduce this type of accuracy and, and performance and bring it to, um, to the field. It cannot replace the laboratory, of course, but whatever it does, it does very well. Um, one thing that it maybe you know you guys don't know because this is something we don't usually talk about, but uh, there's a dome shape, um, kind of like a glass in a dome shape within the cup, and that shape in the way we present the sample um, to the sensor basically helps improve the accuracy of the device. Uh, that's something that many people don't know, but it's very very important the way you you. Um, uh, present the sample to the sensor has a, a huge effect on accuracy and performance. Now, usually in spectroscopy, in near infrared spectroscopy, you can do either transmission spectroscopy, where you have a light source in one side of the sample and the sensor on the other side, and the light basically travels through the sample. That's a setup that can produce high accuracy, but it's very difficult to create those devices. They're usually very expensive and definitely not found so much on, on, you know, on a field environment. On the other hand, there's a reflection setup. That's usually a setup that's more easily found, you know, in, in, in portable units. It's easier to build it, but there's some compromise on accuracy in this case. The SIO cup structure, the dome structure, basically combines those two together. It creates a sort of a reflection uh, setup meaning that it's uh, easy to uh, manufacture and to produce robust units. On the other hand, from an optical perspective, it's very much similar to a transmission uh, uh, setup, meaning that it provides the high accuracy, uh, you know, uh, characteristic of a transmission setup. So in a way, SIOCOP combines those two to provide a high accuracy, high robustness kind of a device. And this is very unique and special to SioCop. Now let's go to the next slide. Another important feature of Sio, that's true for Sio generally speaking, but also for SioCop, 
FioCop uses short wavelength near infrared. Now, when you guys hear about near infrared devices, you'll hear about, okay, so what's the wavelength range of that device? And usually people wanna have higher wavelength ranges because you can get better signals there. However, this is not exactly true uh, in many cases, especially on farm, because uh, the wetter, the more, the wetter the sample is or the material is, it's more complicated to test it with longer wavelengths and actually shorter wavelengths are more important. That's why we chose short wavelength near infrared for SIO because we designed it to be on farm portable in the, you know, those edges of the supply chain. And basically the short wavelength near infrared can penetrate the grain or the plant better because it's not, uh, not being absorbed by water so much. Uh, so while some people would think the longer wavelengths have an advantage, actually, when it comes to lower, uh, excuse me, to a higher moisture material, to wetter <laughs> samples, the short wavelength near infrared would have an advantage. And we can see that, by the way, with devices uh, in laboratory that would use this type of a wavelength range when they're analyzing like, um, um, you know, whole beans or grains or many different other materials that are relatively wet. Okay, next. So, um, we've seen SIOCOP can be used for many different applications, but uh, here today we're specifically focused on how it can be used to uh, feeding within the dairy market, uh, specifically in dairy farms. Um, so it has many advantages and many benefits uh, that it can give to the, to the industry. I would say, but the two main benefits for uh, for the Sio Cup. First of all, it can help the you know the producers or the farmers to ensure consistent dry matter intake. Everyone, I think, well, a lot of people in the industry, I would say, know or taught me that it's very important to uh, keep the dry matter intake consistent. And in order to do that, you have to test your forage to make sure that you know what's the dry matter of the forage because forage is so you know, can change quite a bit uh, because of rain events or just because, you know, the variability when you packed it and so on. And so testing more will get us more information, will get us a better result in, in trying to estimate the dry matter of the forage that are going to feed to the animals. And therefore, SIOCOP can help do that quite, quite effectively. And the second part is on harvest. When, when people harvest um, haylages or corn silage, they want to know, uh, you know, the uh, the moisture in the field just before they go and harvest. Whether they're custom harvesters or just, uh, you know, uh, farmers that uh, harvest their own silage, uh, knowing the silage uh, before you go uh, is very important. And SioCop can help save quite a lot, a lot of time and effort, uh, and and give better results eventually, just because the testing is so much faster and you can actually test a little bit more of the field before you decide to go ahead and chop the field. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, final slide before I turn it over back to Dana. Um, remember, uh, you guys, uh, dry matter testing is tricky. Uh, sometimes we think it's simple, but actually testing for dry matter, especially uh, in forage is tricky because forage is so non-homogeneous it has leaves and particles and uh, grains uh, of all kinds, it becomes very tricky to measure uh, dry matter because when you dry down the material, not every component would dry down uh, the same way and that will create quite a lot of difficulty. Uh, that also creates uh, differences between methods um, when we go ahead and test uh, forage. So for example, if you test it with a uh, uh, you know, uh, um, like a food dehydrator or a caster oven or in the lab with a, you know, air frying or microwave ovens. So each method would have, you know, some deviations and then it's not always the same. It's not going to be always the same. Now we are, you know, we're uh, basing our calibrations uh, on laboratory testing that we do uh, in many laboratories, uh, especially in the U.S., but all over the world. Uh, we have thousands of samples that we collect to create the models and to validate them. We keep improving the model's performance all the time. 
Um, and we try to deliver our customers with the best accuracy and best performance. Just to you know, show you some example of what I, what I mean, uh, you can see on the graph here on the right-hand side of, of the slide, uh, there's some, some uh, examples of silage that was collected in six different farms. Um, and in each farm, we took like, uh, you know, we filled a bucket with the silage, mixed it well, and then broke down the samples or, or the silage into uh, subsamples, like about 10 subsamples and sent them over to the laboratory. And for each farm, you'll see there's an average result, but then there's a variance between the minimum and maximum uh, dry matter reading of the subsamples. And you'll see that even in such a case where you'd expect the, you know, the samples to be almost the same, the, a, a variance of two to 3% is, is quite likely. And this just shows us you know, the uh, natural variability that exists within the silage. Either way, uh, you know, um, we hope that the SIOCOP meets your uh, expectations and you're getting good performance. But if you're not, uh, if there's something that's not working for you, so please uh, contact us. Uh, there's many ways, and you guys are already aware of this, I guess. Uh, and we'll be more than happy to work with you to uh, make sure everything works uh, well. Thank you, Damian, for this intro. Uh, we are. Thanks, Damian. We are now going to go through a few questions that you send us and uh, we prepared answers and then we'll have uh, the possibility to answer other questions. And I saw that you already wrote in the chat. We, of course, will address it. So Penny, our product manager, will talk about the question, what is the accuracy of the cup? Yes, thanks, Dana. So the accuracy of the cup is one of the most common questions that we get, you know, and it makes a lot of sense. People want to know, you know, how good is this product at doing what it says we can do? So it's a very complicated question, though, because there's a lot of different aspects to this. When we talk about measuring accuracy of the cup, are we looking to measure the dry matter percentage of your pile or what's going into your feed? Or are we looking to measure a handful, you know, so something that you would ordinarily send to the lab. So when we think about, you know, how we, you know, current methods of measuring, you know, we're looking at the cost or the lab. And what happens is that we get a bucket, we take a few different parts of that pile, mix it up, and then you take a small part of that and you'll send that to the lab or you'll send it to the costa. Now, essentially what we're hoping for is that that small part is actually representative of what's in that pile, right? So, you know, it, it, it's not an ideal way of testing. A more ideal way of actually testing what's in your pile is to test the whole thing. Because it's so not homogenous, there will be a lot of variation that exists within that pile. And if you had all the time of the day, you could use Sio Cup to literally measure the entire pile. For those of you that don't have the entire day to measure, what we do see is that as you go through and you take more and more samples, you get a lot closer to what is actually the true dry matter of your pile. So if you go to the next slide, Dana. So this is, you know, shown in a graphical representation, right? Where we see that the more samples that you're able to take, the more you get close to the true DM. And, you know, if you've got one sample, there's a wide variation of results that you could get just from that one sample. So again, going back to the more you test, the more accurate it is. Um, all right, but that doesn't really answer the question, right, of, you know, how accurate is the cup? Because, you know, it's not much good to measure a whole lot of samples if what you're seeing is that um, the actual single measurement of your SIO cup is not that on. So what we, what we do is we do compare SIO cup to the cost and to the lab so that you have an indication of how accurate the cup actually is. But it's important to have a few considerations when you're looking at this. So even when you take a SIO cup measurement, and you then split it out, you know, give a bit to the costa, a bit less to the lab, there's still variation even in that one handful that you've then separated out. Also important to consider is the variations that exist within those different methods. So if you go to the next slide, yeah. Um, we can see that even the lab itself has variations and there's variations between labs in testing procedures and in the reference data that they use to build their own calibrations. So we've seen up to 1% error just between labs. 
And of course, the Costa has, you know, a much larger error. It's not as fine-tuned an instrument. Um, and we've seen error up to 3% in, within a Costa. And that's due to a lot of reasons. So it could be that the Costa is not drying all materials at the same rate. So we do know that, you know, at the end of a test, there are some materials that are not fully dried. Um, volatiles can be burnt off. There's different methods in using the Costa. And of course, human error which means that, you know, if you accidentally knock a sample, that's going to make a big difference to your end result as well. So with all these considerations in place, what is the accuracy of the cup, right? How does it compare to these other methods? We did a test with over 100 different comparisons between uh, the SIU in the lab and the COSTA in the lab. And what we saw is that for any single measurement, the SIU performs very similar to COSTA. So we're seeing pretty good results in terms of most of your results are going to be within 2% of the lab and, um, and obviously, you know, um, less in the higher percentages away. So this, this is, you know, the way that we really position the cup is that we don't say it's as accurate as the lab. We say it's as accurate as a Costa and the benefit of being able to test so many more samples and to really get a true representation of what's in your pile is really where you see those gains in accuracy. The other way to look at accuracy of the cup is to look at the cup to cup variation. So this was a, a study that we did. So it's over 500 different comparisons between any two cups um, using five different cups. And we saw that as the, as the cup correlates to itself, it's very good. So we're seeing, um, you know, over 90% of your results within 2% of each other, which means that it's got a very good correlation of itself. And the other thing to really think, remember when we talk about accuracy is that this is a machine learning algorithm. So the more data we gather and as we go along and we get more robust in our cal calibrations, you'll see that accuracy improving. So it's, a, it's really, there's an advantage to having been gathering data <coughs> for the last couple of years. We're seeing huge gains in that and we're seeing constant improvements in our accuracy as well. All right, I think that's it. Oh, and bias, right. So um, we get a lot of questions saying, you know, why do I have a bias in my results? Now, there's, there's a lot of reasons for there to be a bias. Um, I think a frequent one that comes up is that we see that there's comparison issues. So that means that, let's say you've taken a sample, you've sent it to the lab. You know, if you haven't sent it at the same day, or even if it's, you know, been a particularly dry day, that sample can dry over time. So what you're measuring on the farm is not necessarily what you're measuring in the lab. And of course, if you're measuring against a cost or another instrument, you know, they've got their own error of margin as well. So that's something to consider when you are testing against other methods. Um, other reasons is that best practice is not being followed. So, you know, we have a lot of, um, Dana does some fantastic training and Jared, they do great training on best practice when measuring your, with your carb. I highly recommend attending one of those sessions because it's, you know, really about maximizing and optimizing your cup to get the best accuracy. And there's a lot of things to consider, even though it's a very simple product to use, there's a lot of things that can influence your results. So let's say if you haven't put the lid on when measuring, if you're measuring at a temperature that's outside of your specifications, um, if you haven't kept the cup clean, these can all impact your results and can, it can result in a bias. Um, another reason why you might get a bias in your cup, which is a less common reason, but we do see it, is that the variety is not well represented in our reference data. So if you've got an unusual variety that you're testing, it's possible that a, a bias will come up because of that. It, it is possible also that there is an error in the cup. And because of that, we have a white reference, a self, a self test, I think we call it, um, which is basically a way for you to be able to test the functionality of your cup. So we recommend that you do this you know, once a month, but definitely if you're seeing any issues, we, we really recommend that you run it through that self-test and that will identify if there are any existing problems. But of course, if you do experience any issues with accuracy, you know, we're here to help you and to work through those issues. So of course, be in touch and we'll support you through it. All right, I think that's really it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Penny. Um, is there any questions? Any questions? All right. 
I think we have a couple of more questions, right, here? Yeah, we have a couple more questions, but we wanted to know if you, uh, about this topic that we talked, is anyone has okay. something to say or to share or to ask us? I think okay. that was just very clear in what I said. So there was just nothing to ask. <laughs> so we'll continue to the next thing. Yeah, so I'll take this, uh, this next couple of slides. Uh, there's, uh, these are type, uh, two questions that we had um, that were kind of like uh, coming from, from the audience pre um, pre-meeting and uh, we decided just to uh, generate those answers. So the first one uh, was, will SIO cup be analyzing more constituents than moisture? So um, so first of all, just uh, to make it clear, SIO cup, as I said, is being uh, used to analyze all kinds of materials, forage as well as grains and other, other stuff. Uh, and it can definitely uh, analyze more than just moisture, for example, when we analyze soybeans, uh, we do uh, moisture protein oil. When we analyze wheat and barley, uh, we do uh, moisture and protein. And there's other examples for that. Um, in forage right now, we do moisture only. Uh, the reason is uh, twofold, basically. First of all, forage is very complicated, as I said. It's a complex material. And therefore, uh, it makes it more difficult um, to measure uh, more constituents uh, other than moisture. Um, and specifically, since it is so, so complicated and we see the benefit is mostly out of uh, moisture, we wanna make sure moisture is 100% accurate or as accurate as we can do. So we're focusing all of our efforts to make sure that you're getting, that, that, that our users, our customers are getting, you know, uh, valuable and good results out of the moisture testing. Once we feel that this is well st stabilized, then we'll move on to potentially uh, doing other constituents for forage. I will say though, uh, as I mentioned before, um, forage, oh bless you. Um, um, forage is tricky um, and um, it's difficult to analyze and specifically doing the other constituents in forage can be quite tricky. Um, so whenever, you know, someone will say they're using um, a near-infrared spectroscopy for analyzing other constituents, not moisture in forage, that's wet. Uh, I'll be, you know, you have to be very careful to uh, make sure accuracy is, is reasonable because just to give you an example, today at the laboratory, if a laboratory was to use near-infrared to analyze forage, they would usually dry it down and then do the tests for all the other constituents like NDF, ADF, protein, uh, starch, and so on. They would normally uh, dry down the forage. Um, so uh, obviously this is not something you do uh, on your farm. But, uh, but therefore, that's why we're very careful in moving to other constituents and we're focusing our efforts in <laughs> making uh, moisture as good as we can. Um, next slide. Um, next question was, uh, why won't it work on uh, in the temperature below freezing? Um, so here, that's a very good question. And let me uh, touch on that in a broader sense. So near infrared spectroscopy is sensitive to the sample's temperature. So if the sample, I mean, the temperature of the sample, in this case, the forage will change, it will change the spectrum coming out of the sample. Um, uh, whether you go up or down in, in temperature. Uh, we know how to overcome that uh, in a specific temperature range where we develop our calibrations to make sure that they can, you know, uh, overcome the fact that the temperature creates a certain variation. We know how to deal with that variation. So usually our, our calibrations are valid within a certain temperature range, which will normally be between 35 and 104 Fahrenheit Sometimes it might be 40 to 100, but that's approximately the range we normally support. Um, it will not go below freezing point because what happens is that um, when the material actually freezes, uh, water molecules are completely changed and 
near-infrared spectroscopy is based on vibrations of molecules. And therefore, when, when we get to a freezing of the sample, the, uh, the, the um, vibration mechanism changes completely and it becomes much more difficult up to impossible to actually use that method. So that's why it's, that's true for almost every near-infrared uh, spectroscopy-based device. Uh, it won't go below freezing point. So these were uh, questions you sent us before. Uh, is there anything someone wants to ask? And also we will be happy to hear uh, maybe something from your experience and uh, your use cases or what you are doing. We're happy to, that you will share us. Um, I also think, Tana, there were a few questions sent uh, on the chat. Did we respond to all of them? I think uh, we responded all of them. If this, maybe if there's someone who didn't get a response, just let us know. Okay. So, hello, uh, Francisco here from Chile. Hi, Francisco. Um, Hi, Pancho. Hello. Hello, hello. I know some of you in this time. Yeah. Uh, um, that you say Pancho, I know who you are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a nickname, but it's uh, it's it's good. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for the meeting. Uh, I'm always constantly trying to add something to Damian or Eri or Dana. Uh, but basically, here I want to share that the customers are very happy. We have few now, but we are just starting. But all of them very happy. And uh, yeah, you're right. The common questions are those, you know, uh, just dry matter, why not starch or fiber or protein? Uh, and it's very clear, uh, like Damian says, that uh, we need to focus on uh, dry matter and sometimes try to get some, some uh, economic uh, data about it. You know, it's good to, to, to show the variation, but, but how much in, in money and we are saving or gaining, uh, taking these measures, not just looking at the variation of dry, dry matter, trying to put a, a cost or a economic evaluation will be, will be great. Um, the TMR is, is also a, a common question here, um, but basically it's working good, uh, support by Dana and, uh, well, area is very fast, so it's, it's really, it's really, you know, I'm really glad to, to have contact with you. Um, and one question is, you, you talked about the, the calibration and getting robust. This calibration right now is based on uh, wet chemistry only or the scans or the data that we are taking in Chile, Argentina, United States, is making this equation more robust. Yeah, I'll take this one. So uh, thanks, Francisco, very much uh, for your last question. Um, so the calibrations are based on data that we collect in laboratories. However, and, and I, I mean, data that people collect just like that, you know, um, doesn't come with reference data and therefore we cannot use it to augment within our calibrations. However, we do learn about, you know, um, uh, things that, you know, or uh, the experiences that people have, and by learning about this experience, we further uh, improve the calibrations, not necessarily by adding more data, but making our, our algorithms more robust or fixing bugs that may occur within every system, right? So while we, we do not use that data specifically to uh, add to our calibrations, it's definitely helpful you know, to see the scans of people and just uh, make sure everything works well. And therefore, every feedback that we can get from users is definitely helpful. Now, uh, okay. I did see, yeah, go ahead, Francisco. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, many, some of you know, you know, I'm, I'm uh, the owner of Rock River Lab in Chile. And uh, Rock River is a very important lab for, for, for this system, but um, I own another company, Smart Farming, which is the one who is selling and getting, giving the support to, so it's kind of confusing, but um, I, I helped in, in, in research with Eden, but I 
this is a, just a comment, you know. Um, you see sometimes comparing the Sayo with the Coaster or the Sayo with the Lab, you know. For me, it's, uh, it's not something bad, you know, but I kind of recommend to avoid that comparison with the lab because honestly in Chile, uh, I own the Rogrier lab and all the things, but, I, but I'm absolutely, you know, recommending the, 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 the Sayo for the dry matter on field, you know, uh, but not talking about the Sayo and the lab, the Sayo and the, and the coaster, you know, I think we have a, a huge, opportunity just focusing on the on the side or not not compare not comparing with the lab that that's something that gets my attention in the sometimes in brochures you know side mm -hmm. in the lab uh, my recommendations try sometimes to avoid this side on lab side in, in, in coaster okay that's good feedback thank you francisco i i just want to answer there were a couple of questions added uh uh, what about corn milling uh, byproducts um, like uh, wet distillers and others? So we're definitely looking at these byproducts and we, you know, technically speaking, we can definitely support it. Uh, it's a matter of, you know, for us uh, prioritizing the different materials and, and making this part of our development plan. So we are uh, gauging the market all the time. We are in constant uh, discussions, you know, with laboratories and partners. Uh, to decide, you know, where, what kind of material to uh, develop next. I think that uh, we're upcoming with um, um, green chop, um, small grains, right? Um, and the next afterwards, we're looking at TMR uh, to potentially add that. Uh, but uh, we are also looking at uh, wet distillers. We're looking at soybean meal. We're looking at many other different materials and uh, gradually we'll add more. Uh, but of course, it has to uh, make sense business-wise for us as well. So we're we're constantly, uh, uh, um, you know, looking for feedback from the market and then decide how to act based on that. Um, there was another question about uh, when testing long haylage particles, uh, how important it is that all particles are contained. I think that you know, if you have enough particles inside, it's not critical to have some of the particles outside. What is critical is, uh, especially in, in you know, this uh, dry hay or this longer uh, haylage, if it's, it's, if it's quite long, you know, try cutting the uh, haylage uh, or somehow make sure that it doesn't create a too large, you know, uh, areas where there's no material. Uh, it, it could happen. I mean, corn silage is usually well, well chopped as well as uh, most of the other silages, but when it comes to this relatively dry, long haylage, if it is possible just to cut it a little bit better, that'd be probably the best. Uh, again, I'm not so concerned about things going out. I'm more concerned about what's inside. Um, I guess I didn't see another question that was not Mike, answered. Does, does that answer your question? I have another question that is not in the chat. Yeah. We are a dairy farm in Mexico, and I bought the Sayo Cup and I bought the Sayo Mini. And I had uh, a few questions on the Sayo Cup. I wanted to check, we do a uh, pickup of all the spare food that was left on the pens, and we check for dry matter. But I cannot check uh, only dry matter of a lot. It's a uh, free foreign mix, so it's not just silage or something that was one question and another one i saw the sayo liquid accessory for the sayo mini uh we uh, deliver the milk to a company and we sometimes have to send rush uh, lab uh, testing for antibiotics or fat content on the milk and i also wanted to check if that was possible just a quick uh, yeah antibiotics present, yes or no, or if uh, maybe fat content could be seen on a sample of milk? Yeah, uh, good questions. So uh, with respect to the first one, this is uh, this has to do with the TMR that I just mentioned. So uh, you basically, uh, in order to uh, test the leftovers, you probably need a TMR calibration. Uh, now, um, as, a, uh, as you all know, TMR is a bit tricky because 
different farms will have somewhat different TMRs uh, because you everyone would mix their own mix. Uh, but there's a, sometimes a common ground between most of the TMRs, and this is what we're looking at currently. Uh, this is at development stages, so it's not available yet, but hopefully we'll have a version uh, ready uh, this year in 2022. And once it is ready, you'll obviously get a notification about that, and then uh, you can try it out and see if that works for you. So hopefully, I, I can't comment exactly right now. I don't have the exact timeline for this yet, but once we do, we'll let you know, and hopefully that can be uh, useful for you for that uh, use case that you mentioned of testing the leftovers. Um, with respect to the milk, so um, as for antibiotics, I don't see that happening with SIO in the next uh, this couple of years. It's, uh, I would say, generally speaking, uh, laboratory tests of milk are very uh, strict and we don't look to uh, replace the laboratory in this case. And definitely with antibiotics, it's going to be more complicated. So I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Now, with respect to fat, uh, we have definitely tested that and we can definitely do fat uh, with SIO. However, uh, again, not looking to replace the laboratory, but more like augmented if there were, if there was a reason to test fat on farm, that is in addition to uh, having the regular laboratory checks. Uh, so far, we, you know, we're still trying to understand if that makes sense. Um, but we, again, we don't have a calibration uh, ready for that yet. Uh, if we find out uh, that you know this is something that's important to the industry, uh, then we'll definitely uh, look into uh, developing this. Yeah, thank you. The fat content uh, uh, is a quick measure because we get uh, bonuses based on the amount of fat and the amount of solids and the amount of anything on the milk. So mm -hmm. we test when we see uh, when we make a feed change or when we start having a bit of problems so mm -hmm. what's keeping us is we send the the lab uh, test and then we have to wait a whole day and we have to wait that milk until the next day to deliver it so that the quickness would be the interesting part thanks that, that's very valuable feedback for us thank you just a quick note on the TMR timeline. Um, this is uh, aimed for the end of Q2. Um, so hopefully it will be ready by uh, May or June. Thank you, Eden. Any more questions? Did we answer everything that was written on the chat? Yep. Okay. Uh, and now I would like to hear from you if there are uh, anything that you feel that we you, you would like us to make another training about something you feel we can, we can do better. It's a good opportunity for us to, to talk to you face to face and we will be happy to hear. Uh, yeah, I, I have um, something about it. Uh, I'm more in the, you know, sales and technical support uh, side, even that I understand NIR technology and everything. Uh, I feel that sometimes will be very good since uh, you are worldwide uh, to have some uh, testimonials or some experience in some countries, you know, which type of customers uh, do you have in that country, is companies, is farmers, and how to approach them uh, with some with some strategy, you know that that will be great to know in another country. How do you approach the market? Because it's different, you know. Probably, in, you know, the state is the nutritional consultants here in Chile is basically directly to the farmers or companies like hybrids or seeds companies. Uh, will be great to know some experience outside of uh, our countries. Thanks. Penny, do you want to address it? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point that you've brought up. Um, you know, everywhere around the world, you know, things are done differently. So 
um, you know, and often the value that you present is also different as well. So, you know, um, you know, I just actually got off a call with um, someone from India who is looking um, at selling the product there. And, you know, we were talking about herd sizes of, you know, five to 20 cows. So, you know, obviously thinking about that value proposition, that's very, it's very different. Um, but I think you've raised a really good point in that, you know, we would love to help assist you in being able to make that sell and really being able to fine tune you know, what would work for different places around the world. So yeah, I'd love to um, put something together and maybe we can collaborate on that. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, Guy, do you want uh, to say something from the sales side? Um, sure. Um, so uh, first of all, the, the, the most important thing for us is that uh, um, you guys enjoy uh, and uh, realize the value uh, from the product. Um, our business model, as you all are aware of, um, is based on an annual license. So, uh, um, again, this is the most important thing for us, that uh, you see the value and you keep uh, using this over time. Um, we to try to reach as many um, farms as we can. We work through partners, uh, mainly uh, co-ops, different co-ops, um, or um, other players in the industry, uh, feed companies, uh, consultants, uh, nutritionists, etc. cetera. Um, but again, the, our main concern and our main uh, uh, motivation is to make sure that uh, all of our customers are happy uh, using it and can, if asked, can recommend it to their neighbors. So don't hesitate to uh, um, call us, ask us to uh, train you again, ask us to come visit, to show you uh, face to face. Uh, we're really committed to the success. Uh, we think that we have something that has a lot of value and uh, we want to make sure that uh, you guys realize this value. Another question, do you have a distributor in Mexico yet? Um, yeah, so we actually do not have a distributor for um, uh, the dairy business in Mexico. We do have a distributor for uh, one of our other products. Um, and if uh, you're interested, um, please reach out to either myself or Rodney and uh, we'll be happy to discuss this with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you an email. We're based in the biggest uh, dairy uh, city in, Me in Mexico, and we are dairy farmers ourselves, uh, part owners of the biggest comp meal company in Mexico, and we distribute some other products. And there's also a co-op here that we are part of. So there's uh, various, uh, businesses that are interesting. Great. Uh, so uh, yeah, please uh, um, get in touch with uh, Rodney or myself and um, and we'll be happy to, uh, to discuss this. Okay, anyone else? No, so we really want to thank you for joining us today. We will try to do it from time to time and bring you some interesting content. And if you have any question or need every, anything, you can always uh, contact us. And uh, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, team, for uh, organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.